Hey, Mike, what do Kelly Slater and PT have in common? I don't know. They're both world champs? Nope. They both own Endless Summer Box Set. Oh, my God. Rad. You guys, you can get it, too. The link's in the show notes. Hey everybody, welcome to the Quivercast, where we chat with surfers from all around the world, from all walks of life, and we get their story. Find us at www.thequivercast.com. I am Mike, your host. Let's get into the show. All right. Today's guest is Mike Todd. How are you doing, Mike? Yeah, good. Thanks, man. Stoked to to do this with you. It looks like you got a bunch of good podcasts already going and yeah. stoked to be part of it. Stoked. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, yeah. So actually, let's start in the beginning. Like You started surfing like super young, right? How'd that happen? Yeah. Um, my dad was a surfer. He lived in Texas, grew up there in Southeast Texas and Started surfing when he was about 15, ran away from home because uh, he fell in love with it. Ended up in San Clemente and then from there, Hawaii and uh, Santa Cruz and just kind of all over the place. He got me into it. He got me on the board. Probably, I mean, he used to say when I was around two, he started taking me out and just putting me on the front of his board and stuff. Yeah. So I started pretty young and then uh, kind of just surfed off and on for most of my youth i guess Mm -hmm. and then when i was around third gosh how old was i around 10 probably Mm -hmm. we were living in hawaii on the big island and um two of my friends are super into surfing and good surfers and i just started going with them every day and that's kind of when it started right on you want to talk about your dad for a minute yeah sure okay so your dad's like southeast texas so where's like galveston or like south of that or yeah, he he grew up actually. Galveston was kind of like kind of the zone he went surfing and mm-hmm. surfed. Um, he grew up in Port Arthur, oh, okay, uh, which is just a little bit further east of there, okay, um, on the coast. I guess it used to be like one of the biggest shipping sort of ports in the world, okay. And then they dredged up into Houston, and and so the town just kind of. I mean, I was there probably five years ago, and it just kind of was boarded up ghost town in a way. So it was oh. fun to see that. Wow, trippy. He had an older brother who was a musician and a surfer and stuff. One weekend or something like that, they went down to the beach, played some music and surfed, and that was kind of what got him started. And your dad's name is Mike? Yeah, his his name was Michael or Miguel. Oh, Miguel. Depending who you talk to, yeah. Did he ever tell you how the lifestyle in Texas was surfing? Was there even a surf like culture or anything going on there? You know, when he was a kid, there was... Um, a pier called Meekum's Pier. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of like the main spot for everybody in that area surf. Okay. You know, I don't know how big the scene was, but there was definitely a crew. Like um, okay. there's still one of his good friends that I, I'm in touch with, um, Dean Kimura, who lives over there still and surfs and all that kind of stuff. So there was a little bit of a scene. I guess the pier got washed out oh, okay. a while back by a hurricane, so it doesn't exist anymore, but. I don't imagine the waves were ever very good, but they had enough to to get stoked. Did his parents not dig the surf scene? Is that why he ran away? Or if you don't know these answers, that's fine. But I'm just curious. It yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I mean, he had a tough upbringing. His died when he was really, really young. Okay. Um, he was a track star. He was like a track runner, and what I remember, he had like the county record or something like that. Oh, cool. When he found surfing. He just like that shifted his whole kind of outlook. He felt like Texas wasn't for him. He didn't fit in. Yeah. And he told me he ran away one time, (laughs) uh, got about three counties over, and a cop went up and grabbed him and somehow, I guess, knew who he was and drove him home. A few months later, I guess he tried again, and he hitchhiked to California. Wow. Yeah. Different times, huh? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Do you know what years this is? This is like the... Was it 60s maybe? I mean, yeah, because he was born in 54, so okay. he was like 16 at the time, okay. so like 
yeah, like uh, what would that be, like seventy? Yeah, late sixties, early seventies. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So then he's just followed the surf around. Is that what he kind of did? Yeah, I mean, he ended up in San Clemente. From I don't know exactly if he ended up there right away, but he ended up in San Clemente. He told me he used to line cook at Bob's Big Boys. <laughs> oh, right. I don't know if you remember that place. I and, do totally. Yeah, and they used to sneak into Trestles and surf down there and. And then I think he just hooked up with a couple guys, and and they all went to Hawaii together. And he spent some time on the North Shore. He was kind of a kind of a different dude, and he liked to kind of check things out and see what was going on. And uh, so he just kind of cruised around from from that time, kind of before he met my mom and I was born. Okay. And then in reality, I guess that that kind of continued uh, for a while, anyways. After I was born. Okay. So where were you born? I was born in Mexico City. Wow. Um, far yeah, from the ocean. Mo- <laughs> yeah, pretty far from the ocean. My mom was from South Africa, and she was married. Her first husband was a a guy who is part of this kind of traveling performance group mm-hmm. in that time. And uh, my parents were traveling with that group, and they were called the Illuminated Elephants. <laughs> Sounds so, psychedelic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They all lived in like uh, old school buses and stuff. All so right. up and and they were on one of those trips, mm-hmm. and um, and yeah, I was born born in Mexico City. As they were traveling, like working, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you'd call it working, but they were traveling, doing performances, and that's working. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess they had some kind of grant from the Mexican government okay. to, to do performing around the country or something like that. Okay, so you were just born wherever they were. That's what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was born at home, and story goes there was like full moon, and my mom was there having like a dance thing, and I was born. <laughs> that's rad. Okay. I don't know how true it is, but that's kind of a myth. <laughs> Are your parents, were they total hippies, or like what were they? Yeah, full on hippies. Full on hippies. <laughs> That's so cool. Okay. Yeah. So, are you a Mexican citizen or American citizen? You know, I'm American citizen. It's a, it's a funny story. So, I was born in Mexico. Yeah. They took me to the hospital a couple of days later to get me checked out. Yeah. And then immediately went back to the states to introduce me to my dad's family, and then to California to my mom's family. Okay. And then from there we went to Hawaii, and. About a month later or something like that, they went to the federal building in Hilo okay. and said, oh, our son was born in Waipio Valley and we just got to town for the first time. It's an odd story, but I was born here, but my birth certificate says Hawaii. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So. How does that make you feel? Is that trippy? or like, what, it it's, is- it's, it's a bit of a bummer in a way because... Like I'm a I'm a Howley in in Hawaii. I'm yep. a gringo in Mexico, and I'm uh, I kind of feel out of place in the states. So it's kind of a weird uh, oh, kind of combo. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and then um, you know, like I spent a lot of time in Mexico. Most of my youth, I guess, uh, about a fair amount of it in Mexico. It was always kind of odd because uh, I didn't like my parents would say, "Oh, he was born, but here, but." didn't have any like proof. So right. this is kind of an odd, odd thing. That um, That is interesting. Quite a few years later, probably in like 2010 or something like that, my mom went to that hospital to see if she could find paperwork and the hospital didn't even exist anymore. Uh, yeah. Literally, there's no record. So, literally. Okay. So I'm going to fast forward and then we'll just keep going backwards though. But I oh. have to ask you this while we're here. I guess you had a birth certificate that said Hawaii, right? Yes. Okay. So that was how you get to travel. I was going to say, that sounds challenging with the birth certificate or not having one and you yeah, traveling no, all like, the world. Yeah, like I said, um, they went to that federal building in Hilo, okay, um, the it. Big Island, and like I have a yeah. legit U.S. birth certificate. Okay. Going backwards again, your families, are they like um, traveling, surviving, and surfing? Or like what's the lifestyle, your childhood lifestyle? Yeah. Um, it was – I don't know if, you got, if you've ever seen the documentary they did on the Pasquitz family. Uh, surf wise. Yes. A long time ago, but yeah, I, I'm familiar yes. with it hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, I saw that, I don't know, probably 10 years ago as well. Okay. Um, and I was like, that's the closest thing I've ever seen to the way I grew up. Really? Interesting. Um, yeah, but the only difference was it was basically just me. Yeah. Um, I yeah. have a half sister Okay. and she would be with us some of the time. Um, okay. But for the most part, it was us living in a van or kind of just driving around, making ends meet. 
yeah, my parents were musicians and surfers and mom was super into like tarot and astrology and yoga and all that kind of stuff. So he would kind of find ways to do classes or do readings or whatever. Yeah. But that was kind of the way it was. We just, my dad always wanted to be there at the beach surfing. My mom was kind of a gypsy vibe as well. And kind of just always wanted to keep moving and checking stuff out. So pretty much until I was in high school, I don't think we lived in one place longer than like six months. Really? So how'd that make you feel? Um, you know, pretty disconnected from like the, the idea of home. Oh, okay. Um, you know, like I was saying also, like I was never, I was a gringo here, Howley in Hawaii kind of thing. Um, yep, yep. and then also not really ever having a, like a place that we called home. Yeah. Um, one thing that was kind of cool is we'd always end up kind of going back to places. So I have, you know, friends in kind of all over that I've known since I was really young and still have connections to certain ones in different parts of the world, I guess. That's um, right. Yeah. So like, and then the other thing is like, I learned to be pretty adaptable and pretty comfortable and just kind of finding a, a way to kind of just be wherever I am. And then were you going to school or were you homeschooled or like how'd that go out? That was a bit of, um, a bit, it varied. So my mom had a, a master's degree in psychology. So she, so she was would, a super smart lady. Yeah. Both of my parents were like super smart. My, my mom was like book smart mm -hmm. and pretty much couldn't work a VCR, <laughs> 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 but like, like crazy smart, like, um, like photographic memory. Yeah. yeah. And then my dad was super smart too, just always reading and drawing and painting and just curious guy. So yeah, that was always cool. Like I learned a lot from both of them as far as like, you know, I started reading a lot from a really early age and all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. So my mom had that master's degree, you know, I would go in and out of different schools depending on where we were. Yeah. Sometimes she would just kind of teach me whatever she thought I needed to know. Yeah. Sometimes we do those like send away homeschool courses. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would check into a Mexican school or a school in Hawaii. Sometimes I'd do like an international school. But that always kind of was pretty tricky because we moved so much. So yeah, the ones that really kind of worked were those send away courses. Mm hmm because it didn't matter where you were. Yeah. Um, and quite often we would get the course and my mom would just grade it. So I didn't, uh, you know, up until whatever, junior high school, your grades don't really matter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, you know, the school systems vary so much that like one time we went back to California, I didn't know, I don't know. I didn't know some, something. So mm -hmm. they helped me back a grade, but then we went to Hawaii like the next year or something. And they just put me back in the grade I should be in. So I skipped third grade altogether. <laughs> Interesting life. Okay, we'll keep going. Yeah. This is super yeah. trippy. I mean, were they like partying or like, do um, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't sound like they're like the sober stay at home TV watching family. No, definitely not. I okay. mean, my, my parents at one time were like, you know, try everything except for the hard drugs. Okay. <laughs> like they weren't, they weren't Stay into away that from heroin stuff. and smoke weed. They were not, yeah, they were not into that stuff at all. You know, okay. mushrooms and psychedelics and that yeah. kind of stuff. Okay. They smoked. But at one point when we lived in Hawaii, like my dad grew weed for a living. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so there's nothing like wrong. That, it's legal now too, by the way. Well, now it's legal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but at the time it was pretty gnarly because it was also, we lived, yeah, we lived on Big Island, and there was, like, this whole thing called Green Harvest, which was, like, this whole military operation to kind of cut that back. And it was funny because, like, my dad would harvest, and, like, the house would be, you know, piles of weed. And they'd be like, okay, nobody's allowed to come over until this is cut, dried, and sold. Yeah. That was his money. <laughs> so was, yeah. Was, surf. Yeah. And um, I remember, like, one year he had a, a good harvest, and I was like, I don't know seven years old and i got a hundred dollar bill for my birthday that's right is that right so yeah, seven I mean, years old, time, that's a lot of money yeah that was it was a lot of money i was freaked out um <laughs> but it definitely put me off of kind of at that point it put me off of weed for you know i didn't didn't touch it till i was late 20s oh, okay yeah just kind of so it's like, kind uh, of a blessing actually probably yeah i mean it, it definitely gave me 
a very particular perspective on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Also, you're traveling all these places, and you said you surfed as as, as a young Grom and all th- all around. How did that help in your surfing, or did that help your surfing? Surfing different places all the time. You know, I think so. Um, I you know one of the spots that really changed or helped me get good at surfing was we lived at Rio Nexpo for quite a while. Okay. And it's a you know fun left point. So I was surfing every day out there, and it gives you, you know, living at a point gives you that time to figure out boards and do 10 turns on a wave yeah. and feel them out and all that kind of stuff. So there, and then we lived in Puerto Escondido for a while, but not really. How old are you um, then? You know, I think the, when we lived there, I was probably around 13. Wow. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, we lived all over, and then we lived on the Big Island. I don't know if you have heard of Kalapana. No, but... Which is like... Yeah. Um, Kalapana is like the southeast shore of... Okay. Like mm. the southeast... South shore of, of Big Island. Okay. And we lived there a lot when I was really young, and then uh, there was a couple different eruptions in the 90s. Mm. Yeah, 80s and 90s that the, the town doesn't even exist anymore. Oh, it's gone. Um, People are starting to kind of, well, they've already started to, but people are moving back there and building houses, but it's like houses sitting in a field of dried lava. Rad. <laughs> you kind of rad. Okay. Yeah. So did it help your surfing? Yeah. No, I mean, I like just living all over the place, feeling out different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one thing that was interesting to kind of feel out and notice as I got older was, um, you know, the buoyancy of water. That kind of stuff was trippy to kind of figure out. Like Hawaii has a lot more buoyancy in the water. I don't know if it's just that or also the power, but I always felt like when I got back to California, I didn't float as much. Okay. You know, just surfing all sorts of different ways, like you said, and um, surfing with different people and and just all that kind of stuff. You're going to I don't know. You're you're in wherever you're camping in California, and then you're going on the Big Island and wherever else you're going. How is it being a 12 year old or Puerto Escondido as a 13 year old? How is it paddling out to a lineup that you may not know many people or, or anybody at all? Um, well, that was kind of part of it is, you know, we, we would go to these places at different times of my life. Mm-hmm. And like I was saying, we would go back to these places. Okay. So you're from, kind of familiar. Yeah. So, like, you know, um, the, I think the first time we went to Porto was in like 85. 86 something like that and there wasn't anything on the beach even you stayed in a little like hut up on the road on the hill yeah and there was like a little goat track down yeah like next but was kind of the similar but also i think um just being a grom and being out in the surf Mm -hmm. and being stoked people were just kind of cool i would imagine so yeah for the most part and you know i think the other thing was i like my dad was super into like, okay, this is the etiquette. You know, you don't mess around with that sort of stuff. So yeah, you got to be respectful, all that kind of stuff. So I think showing up at breaks and being pretty good with that stuff. I know I definitely stepped on toes <laughs> yeah, here and there, but, but uh, for the most part, just being a stoked grom and, and like having respect and all that kind of stuff. Pretty cool everywhere I went. So you got accepted a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I was a decent surfer too. So yeah. people were stoked, and and also like a lot of times, I don't know if you know um, George uh, Lambert. Is that his last name? He's a Huntington guy. Yeah, uh, I know the name. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so he was like a, a, a one of the guys that was always down at Expo when I was a kid. He would always uh, okay. spend time down there, and so I remember him like heckling me because I wasn't doing a big enough a bottom turn, or you know, <laughs> so like just having guys like that always kind of like in pushing you. Yeah, just kind of giving you tips, giving you a hard time, pushing you, all that kind of stuff. Okay. But, yeah. So what about going the opposite direction? You're accepted by probably a lot of the guys, uh, adults or whatever. Now you're paddling out at, let's say, I don't know, Lowers or T Street or something, whatever's kind of a heavy, exactly many. And you have a lot of peers your age. How are you accepted? Is it the same acceptance or is it you have to prove your spot? Um. I think that by the time I was spending a lot of time surfing out there, mm-hmm. um, I was already doing the NSSAs and that okay. kind of stuff. Yeah. So we all kind of knew each other yeah, already. Yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't like I'd paddle out and a bunch of unfamiliar faces yes. or anything like that. I'd paddle out and it was like, 
Mike Lossness and the Godowski brothers and Nate Yeoman and Yeomans and Chris Ward, you know, like, so, and it's kind of like, um, you know, like all the different worlds, like surfing, the world is so small, when mm-hmm. you're in it. you know, mm-hmm. somehow, whether you know somebody personally or not, you know of them or yes. you look up to them. So you just kind of like follow them like a puppy dog or, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. So I, I never really had too many issues in Hawaii. You know, I always kind of, when I started going back when I was older mm-hmm. and I was living in California, I was, I was always very conscious about like, okay, who's who, you know, where do I sit? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. And cause I really didn't want to get, on the wrong side of things. Mm-hmm, of course. <laughs> to be honest, I never really had any issues. I mean, I can't really think of any major issues I had and in a general sense. You know, there's always the little run ins here and there that happened, but yeah, nothing, shit um, happens. I was pretty fortunate. Yeah, I was pretty fortunate. That's right. You're talking about contests. So when did you start doing contests? Um, I mean, I think I really only started, I did, I did some here and there um, when I was younger. Mm hmm. I think the first time I started really getting into it, I was around 13, 12 or 13, and I was surfing for Lassen. Okay. Uh, that guy had a, a surf brand for a while. Okay. And um, I was living on Maui at the time. I would go over to Oahu and spend you know, a few months on the North Shore. And so I started doing the, the HSAs and the NSSAs and all those events there. And kind of started getting into it. And then after that, um, we moved to California. I think right after that, I got picked up by Billabong and pretty much just started surfing every event, every weekend kind of thing. Every NSA, USSF. Okay. All that kind of stuff, yeah. Your parents kind of being, well, they're surfers, or your, mom, your dad's a surfer. What they think about contests? Were they all about it, or were they like anti-contest? Well, my mom grew up in South Africa, okay. uh, in in Durban, with like Sean Thompson, Thompson and yeah. Michael Thompson, and like I think it was Michael's sister Jennifer Thompson was like one of my mom's best friends growing up. So she was oh, in that really? world as too. Uh, okay, yeah. So she grew up, you know, around that, like hanging out at New Pier and um, all those like kind of spots there. Okay. Um, and then my dad was a surfer, and I think, you know, I think he kind of he kind of was always a little bit anti. Okay. Um, but at the same time, he was super stoked that I was able to do that. Mm-hmm. They were both very supportive. I think the other part was like when I was 13 and we finally moved to California, my dad ended up moving back to Mexico. Okay. So my mom was a single mom. So mm-hmm. like all of a sudden I was getting free clothes and shoes and getting help, you know, rides to the contest and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And so she was stoked for me because I was doing good and I was happy and having fun and it was also helping her out. So it was like a win-win kind of thing. And oh yeah. Yeah. And I had some really good mentors, you know, like Chewy Reina was an awesome mentor I had when I was really young. Okay. And then, um, Billabong, Bob Hurley and those guys hired Mike Lamb. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, I know um, who he is. yeah. So they hired him to kind of coach the whole junior team and he and I connected super strong and, uh, ended up working together and having an awesome run. Um, yeah. And just like I ended up winning a bunch of events and stuff. So I was having a lot of fun. It was, <laughs> you know, I was still. Well, at that point with your mom, did you have like an apartment or somewhere to live like permanently or are you still kind of traveling? So my mom's family all immigrated from South Africa and ended up in Laguna Beach. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yes. And at that time, you know, it was a hippie, artsy, a hippie little artsy village. Yep. And so. It was still kind of that way when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So we lived in that general area. Yeah, between Dana Point, basically, and um, Laguna. Okay. Pretty much moved every year to just a different house, but it was all in the same area. And I I got to go to the same school and hang out with all the same friends. And I have a cousin who's basically like a big brother. I had a group of friends, and I had a couple of good friends that were a little older that were surfers as well so like one of my friends was 16 when i was 13 and so it was like he took us all surfing every every day basically where was your go-to spot there wasn't surf in laguna Mm -hmm. it was pretty much you know we we would head down to oceanside the jetties all the time that was kind of like our go-to because it was like always something yeah salt creek was was on the radar but um i think oceanside was more of a was more our zone because it was also really uncrowded and there was just like <laughs> North Jetty, South Jetty, 
peaks in between. So yeah, and I mean also like funny places like um I don't know if you know trails and yeah, sometimes you go down the lowers. Yeah, exactly. And depended kind of who I was hanging out with, who I was I'd go on these little runs where like Newport would be kind of the go to for okay. you know, a, a period or then it'd be Oceanside, then Creek, then so it just all kind of bounced around a little bit. But I'd say Oceanside was probably our, our go to. Okay. And then like so surfing a lot of the beach breaks like Oceanside or even trails, which is kind of a slower way, but um did that help your contest surfing? You know, I think really what it was, I mean, I think just surfing, yeah, you know, of all day, every day kind of thing. And um, two of the guys that we surfed with all the time were Braun Hughes' them okay. and uh, Mike Morrissey. Okay. So, like, those were two of the three, like, there was four of us basically that surfed all together, and those were two of them. Mm-hmm. So, like, Mike was super good, and he was, you know, airs and kind of a bit more of, like, because he had – such a skateboard and snowboard influence. Yeah. So he had kind of a different approach, but it was, you know, just, it gave me a different way of seeing it. And then Braun was kind of just an all around great surfer. So it was just like a good little battle we had between us. I think that was more what drove us all. And then just surfing a lot. And then honestly, I felt like my surfing grew a ton working with Mike Lamb. I don't know if it was just like a period where I was, growing a lot in my, in my surfing and also the confidence I was having from doing well in the events and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, you know, it was one of those things where I just loved it and I never really paid attention to like, Oh, I need to get better. Mm -hmm. It was just like, it just had this kind of natural progression. And then not until like kind of the end of my competitive career, did I actually start working with, I worked with Ian Carnes for a little while. Okay, And that was really about like technique and that kind of stuff. And always look back on that and kind of regret not having that in kind of my pocket earlier. I felt like that brought so much to the table, but it, it was a little late in the kind of timeline of everything. So you said you want, you were doing really well in the amateur contest. How, how like, what do you, what do you surf in NSSA and you're just like dominating or? You know, I think I wouldn't say I was dominating in like, well, the last year I did it as a, the year before I graduated high school, the okay. year I graduated high school, that, that same year, I won, I, I don't quote me, but I think it was like 18 out of 20 events. Wow. That's huge. And yeah, something like that. And then the other ones I didn't win, I was in the final. So okay. it was like, so that year was like crazy. The other years it was I was, you know, I'd win here, I'd get, I'd get to the semis, I'd get to the finals. It was always, I was always competitive with everybody, but that year just things clicked. Okay. You know, but it's funny because I never really had good luck in nationals or any of those bigger events. I don't, you know, I think the, the I, in a way I'm good with pressure, but I think the pressure would get to me in those bigger events. And so I never really, I'd get to the finals and get fourth place kind of thing or, Okay. Um, stuff like that. But I don't know that last year in, in sort of the, the, the team, I don't know what the, I can't remember the name of the divisions, but those years, that last year, you know, like I, open I was, or something. Yeah. Open, open. And then, yeah, I don't know there. Cause there was two divisions in, in, uh, NSSA that I was doing. I think it was open and explore or something. Yeah, exactly. So there was that. And then I was doing USSF's. There was another little series a uh, guy in Huntington was running called, gosh, I'm blanking on it right now. Oh, there was like a CCSA one or something. I never really did those. Um, there was another one. Oh, but, like an HB um, Surf Series or something, I think yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. That's okay. what it was. So I was doing those a lot too. And you felt confident. And then are you thinking about being a pro at this point? Like, what are you thinking in your head? Oh, yeah. I mean, from 12 years old, I was like, I'm going to be a pro. <laughs> <laughs> you had goals. I, you know, it wasn't even a goal. It was just like, that's what it is. Yeah. I remember like families telling me it wasn't possible. I remember like counselors in school saying you're, you're out of your mind. It's not possible. And I was just like, I don't, what, I don't even know what you're saying. It doesn't like what you're saying isn't even reality. This is what it is. <laughs> so Okay. So you're talking about like, you know, if you're the career counselor, you take a test in like 10th grade. What do you want to exactly. be? Exactly. Exactly. And you're like a pro server? 
it, yeah. there's no there's no check on that in that area <laughs> <laughs> no no i mean and i would always do the little tests and it'd be like you should be an engineer or an architect or stuff okay. like that and i always found that stuff super interesting and actually i ended up going and studying architecture oh cool so i have an architecture degree oh right um at that age i was like no i'm surfing that's what i'm doing and so um, cool they were like, no, you, well, you got to do your SATs and apply to school. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> wow. I don't want to waste my time doing that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so, at, at this early stage too, you're not burned out at all. You're just, you're oh, loving no. life surfing. Okay. So you're, all your buddies are together. You're your four friends you're surfing with. What are you guys doing when you're not surfing? <sighs> What were we doing when we weren't surfing? I mean, what are you watching? Like hanging around watching surf videos? Are you looking for chicks, or like, are you at the arcade? Like, oh um, gosh, I mean, all like, you remember uh, surfing. <laughs> I mean, really, that's all I remember. Um, that's cool. We, we weren't really into video games. I mean, it wasn't really that era. Yeah. Um, it was like go surf. If it was surfing Laguna, it was like go surf and hang out at the beach all day. And if yeah. it wasn't surfing Laguna, it was like go surf somewhere and go back to the laguna and hang out the beach all day yeah so it was kind of that we were just kind of like surf rats cool um morsey like i was saying had like a, he was super into skating was super good at it and he was super into snowboarding braun was a snowboarder too our our other buddy steve who was the older guy that drove he was a surfer and a snowboarder but you know unless it was winter um I don't know. We were just kind of hanging out, watching surf videos. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It was like it was like that was what it was. Yeah, and not getting in trouble, not doing bad things. No, I mean you know definitely had our our fair share of beers, but nobody okay. was getting into anything beyond that. Really, that's rad. All right, so you you get out of out of the amateur ranks and you're you're turning pro. How'd that go? Basically, I graduated high school. Yep. In June of 1999. Okay had nationals us open all that stuff in i guess late august september somewhere in there yeah. um a bunch of us like braun was with me um there was a, like kind of we all started at the same time it was like amaya goodwin jesse merle jones sean burrell it was like this whole cool crew of guys our age and we all just went to europe we went to spain and then down to portugal I don't think the first year I was there, we went to France, but it was just like from then on, it was just like, okay, let's go. So, you know, I was in Europe for like three weeks, a month, maybe like right away and then down to Brazil. And it just kind of was like nonstop from then on. You guys go to, to Europe and is that your first time in Europe? Yeah. So we just had these events and I mean, that was, that was the first year we were doing it. So we were all just super stoked to be there. And so it was like, Cruising around town, you know, nobody cared how old you were. And I guess we were all 18 anyway, so we yeah. were, you know, drinking wine and eating cool. baguettes and <laughs> yeah, just kind of feeling it all out, having fun. So was it all about fun or were you worried about making heats? I mean, for me, it was always, that was always my focus. Okay. Um, and maybe to a detriment, actually, because like if I didn't do well in the event, I'd kind of get like, it would ruin my trip. Yeah. I think. Yeah, and I mean, I kind of coming off the year I had as an amateur. Yeah, I kind of had these expectations that I was just going to roll in and it would be on, and I would qualify. And yeah, walk right through and had a very different experience than that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, let's say your first pro heat in Europe. Do you remember who you surfed against and and how'd that go? Gosh, I don't even remember. You don't remember? Okay. I Can remember the the event, one? but okay. I don't remember the heat. Do you have a memorable event? Of that first trip, um, where you did good or you did bad or whatever. I remember a turn <laughs> oh, that's in right. one of my heats. That's interesting. Like, yeah, I remember like this one front hand kind of like off the lip, kind of where I disappeared into the foam and came out. And okay, it was kind of funny, you know. Like at that age, I was watching so many surf videos that like I'd get somebody in my head for the day. Okay, and kind of feel like I was surfing like them. Oh, that's right. I don't know. There was, I think, I think maybe like searching for Tom Curran had just come out or something oh, like that. Yeah. And so I like kind of had this like Curran-ish. 
I, de- I don't don't say I was surfing like him, but I have this idea in my head that uh, I was kind of like doing his little uh, vibey things. Okay, that's yeah. so cool. But you're a goofy foot too, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so you just had to do a little mirror thing. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, totally. Okay. Do you remember coming across like a first big name, like you've maybe seen in the mag but never met in person, and yet you're in a heat with them, and how'd that feel? Um, you know, that never really happened with like the big names, okay. um, until later. Okay. Like, you know, I think at that time, Bruce, like it was kind of when Bruce Irons was starting, okay. um, a lot of like the kind of Aussie guys were there, like Joel Parkinson and Mick and all those guys were all the same age, yep. but I had already kind of gotten to know them a little bit through oh, okay. like pro juniors and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, other than like there being some funny kind of rivalries between, you know, the Australians and the U.S. and things like that. And but I always kind of felt like they were made up. (laughs) What do you mean? Like in the media or in your head? No, like no. Like I think like, for example, when we started, there was this thing called LMB that Sarge, you know, the photographer had started. Okay. No, I'm not familiar with it, but I know who he is. And I yeah. So it was like supposed to be like bravado some i don't know something okay but then everybody just started saying it was lick my balls <laughs> <laughs> and it was supposed i don't know i don't know if this is how everybody saw it but like somebody told me or maybe i'm making it up that um it was sort of like uh, a fuck you to the u.s guys oh, okay and it was also interesting too like one of the things that i always saw and kind of uh felt like we were missing as as uh us was like the aussies were always super supportive of each other the brazilians the europeans and the americans would like run in little clumps okay little but, clicks. It, but it yeah little clicks and everybody still got along and but it was always kind of like the only people that would show up for your heat were like the guys that you were traveling with and even then it, it always felt a little bit individualistic which is i think kind of a a part of the american you know ethos okay you know i was kind of like uh like looked at the other, I don't know, uh, groups of, of the surfers, like the Aussies and stuff. Yeah. And just was like, always like, dang, that would be so cool to have like, you know, a crew in a your big corner every group. time you surf. Yeah. yeah. And how much it helps with like, you know, if somebody's watching the surf and mm-hmm. hey, I saw that, that, that sandbar is turning on because the tide's changing or, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that was one thing I noticed. The Hawaiians also were really good at that. They were super like every Hawaiian would show up for every Hawaiian's heat kind of thing. Okay. I think we all, for the most part, everybody was like, you know, I don't remember there being many people ever on tour that were like dicks. Yeah. Especially out of the water. Like, you know, the Brazilians were extra aggressive in the surf. Mm Mm-hmm. But for the most part, like super cool on land. Okay. Aussies were always fun and funny and laugh, you know. And so it was like I never, I never really felt like I had any like super bad run-ins. Okay. I had one later in life, but that was a uh, kind of something else. <laughs> now you're working your way up up the ladder, and how's that going? I would do all right. I'd get like you know round before quarters or yeah. maybe a quarterfinals here or something like that. Was that satisfactory to you? Or I mean, at that age and just starting out, I was like, okay, you know, was, I was doing things like I was looking at the ratings from the year before, and I saw like, okay, Taj finished a hundredth his first year. Yeah, and I was like, okay, if I finish above him my first year i'm fine you're better off and than him. <laughs> yeah and then next year he finished 12th mm-hmm. wow. and i'm like yeah. okay so i'm gonna do that like that was kind of like the way i thought about it yeah that worked that so was it uh <laughs> well the first year the first year I, I i think i finished higher than 100 i finished you know I, technically i beat him in, in the ratings okay rad. <laughs> no no not the not i didn't beat him in the ratings. no that year, year but I, no i understand you know, the theory saying. i have yeah yes. the theory of the year before kind of thing you you were higher ranked than he was the year previous like wh- however that worked yeah, yeah, yeah however yeah. i was i was lining up with those years gotcha. um, you know i just kind of like would have a good start and then kind of like never really get a good consistent rule thing going and then yeah. i'd have a good event here and I don't know. I just never clicked as a 
uh, as a pro. I mean, I had some good events. Like, I don't think I won one sort of regional California event. I got second in a couple of events, made the final at the HIC pipe event one year. Yeah. Um, made the finals at the trestles event. So I like, you know, I had these events here and there where I did well, but I just couldn't put a year together. I just okay. never had that, uh, never had that work out. The whole time though, if you look at a certain, I don't know what years, but let's say like early 2000s or mid 2000s, you, your yeah. pictures in the magazine a lot, especially a lot of ads. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, <laughs> you know, I think coming off of the amateur career I had, yeah. I got to know the photographers really well, and I had, you know, Brandy Faber. Mm -hmm. You know Brandy? Um, I don't know him personally, he, but yeah. He was like a, a huge mentor for me, and he kind of showed me the way to get photos and who to hang with and kind of like just where to be so yeah. that you're in people's minds. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, yeah, I was always invited on trips. Things always worked out. I think also like, you know, being a really successful junior – gave me kind of this um i always called it uh this idea of like what i could be okay and so a lot of people were super supportive of that you know like you're going to be the next blah 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 yeah um and so that like gave me tons of support and all that and and I think, you know, I was also like I said, I think I worked with the photographer as well. I knew how to like I knew what I needed to kind of do for right. it to look right uh -huh. on film. And one of the big set things I learned, I can't remember who it was, but we went to Trestles one day and we shot with a photographer and then I got to look at all his slides. Okay. From there, and I was with Brandy, actually, and we looked at every one of his slides, and Brandy was like, see what you did there, see what you did there, see what you did there, and something from there it clicked, and I was like, okay, like I needed to do this, and intuitively understood how to surf for good photos, and then had the support of like you know the Hurleys, um, Brandy, in the early days, um, Will and Chewy at Dragon, and then with Electric, and so it was like, you know, I just, I kind of felt like I was in the right place with a lot of that stuff. And, and then also just, I think being in California and I, uh, flame would always be down at Creek and I made yeah. a huge effort to like connect with him. And that was, a uh, I think a pretty, uh, political kind of like, if you knew that it helped you because mm -hmm. he was the editor at the time. So yeah. And then if you got a sh if you went down and shot with him and he got a photo, it was it was in. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this: There's guys that have been more successful you in contests, like world rankings and stuff. But what are your thoughts of who's going to go down in history more? Because you're in the magazines and pe people are going to hold on to magazines and you know. Do you understand what I'm, the question is? The question is, um, who's going to be more well known in in a hundred years? Well. <laughs> I I would say the guys in the contest. Cause, really? Because um, I think, okay. yeah. Okay. I mean, I think unless you're Bruce Irons mm -hmm. and, you know, he ultimately did qualify. Yeah, he did. But, you know, he was like an amazing free surfer. And, and, yeah, uh, yeah, he was yeah. an amazing surfer, period. But right. like, you know, initially was like known as for his free surfing. You know, also, I think the other thing that really made a difference, especially at that time, was Taylor Steele's films. Yes. Movies, videos. I don't know what you're supposed to call them. <laughs> Movies, uh, I'm guessing. But okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the thing that was always funny to me was, to this day, like, I moved away for a while and went back east and studied architecture. Okay. And when I moved back to California, I talked to Nate Yeomans, and he was like, yeah, go grab a board at Lost, and they'll give you a the bro deal kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I went there and the guys had like no clue who I was and thought I was some kook. <laughs> 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 so like, I don't think that the photos I had or anything like that are going to sort of stand the test of time, so to speak. Okay. You know, I had my, like the groups, like the people that knew who I was and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think most of the people that would remember are like of a certain age. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 like, I'm going to take a different stance. I think the guy that was 30th or 40, or you know, the top okay. 44, they, they didn't work <laughs> with photographers, right? 
So that yeah, you, you I mean, run by their name uh, on a surf thing, and plus you're talking to the kid at Lost that's 21, right? He only yeah. knows who who the guy down the street's ripping, or you know, or Joel yeah, yeah, or whoever. Yeah. But when they start getting into like surf history when they're 40, I think yeah. that's it's all going to change. But that's my opinion. I have no clue. Yeah, no. I mean, I guess I wasn't thinking of it in that way. Yeah. You know, like there's definitely those middle the middle range guys yeah. that never really kind of did either mm-hmm. or never really got kind of, you know, top seen. three in the world. That's epic. Yeah. Epic. Right. But and, you can't find them in a magazine. <laughs> yeah. Or, and you don't, you don't like, I could no probably video. name a few people and yeah. you wouldn't know their names right? Um, or know who they were. But right. I think the way I was thinking of it more was like in comparison to people like Joel. Or, yeah. You're thinking of the top dogs. Yeah, so I was like, you know, I never, yeah, exactly. Like, those guys stand the test of time, and people know they're, but they conquered both. They conquered both. Yeah. Photos, videos, and, and ratings. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So, I guess, I guess I always kind of imagined that I was going to be a part of that. So, I still kind of like when I think of success in surfing, Mm -hmm. that's, that's well, yeah. where that's what I see is you know that's what I kind of that's the benchmark. Yeah, that's a thousand guys on the QS right now. They, they all yeah, but I mean, how many guys other, are going to make it? <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the other thing that was crazy to me. The first year I started on the QS, the ratings were two pages. Yes. Two pages. Yes. And I think they went to like 150. Yeah. And that was it. That was it. Uh, when I quit, like when I stopped competing and left the tour and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I think there was like 700, like they rated so up crazy. to that. Yeah. So it's like in, uh, six years or whatever that was seven years. It went from like, you know, 150 people consist- consistently surfing events yeah. on the QS mm-hmm. to 700 people trying to do it. Yeah. So uh, like you pay your fee, right? <laughs> yeah. You pay your fee and, and like, you know, the world's growing as it always is. Yeah. And, more servers. Um, yeah. Okay. Trippy. Yeah. So how long do you pursue this pro surfing? So I started on tour in sort of end of summer, 99. Mm-hmm. And I think the last sort of, you know, day I would call myself a pro surfer was like 2000, like summer of 2007. Okay. So seven, eight hard years on it. Yeah. And you know, like, it was tricky because I would be traveling to compete on the QS. And then I was also conscious of like, I need to get photos and do all that sort of stuff. Yep. So I was then getting home and going on trips and just feeling a little bit overloaded. Yeah. Um, Burnout. But yeah, definitely, you know, times felt that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you'd go on a good surf trip and feel stoked for a month <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> from a couple good tubes or whatever. Um, but also like, you know, being on the road off and on, like, you know, seven, eight months a year is a uh, wears on you. Yeah. yeah. How would you label your pro career? <laughs> Give me some options. I don't know. I mean, was it successful or was it, were you disappointed at the end? Did you leave bitter? I mean, I don't know. You got to kind of fill in the blank, I guess. Um, I wouldn't say I left bitter. Okay. Um, I definitely didn't feel like I lived up to the potential. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I also, I left because I was really ready for something different. Yeah. Um, like when I stopped surfing, Heath Walker and I were super good friends. Mm-hmm. And he was the marketing, the surf team manager, basically, at Reef. Okay. And he came to me and offered me to be the junior, mark, like the junior team, okay. man, mark, surf marketing guy. Cool. And um, I had just been at a wedding, and the guy I was sitting next to, a friend I was sitting with, was studying furniture making in Maine. <laughs> wow. And so I, like, went home the night after the wedding and started researching this thing. Cause it was something I always kind of was like, I want to try that. Okay. And so I, I kind of got offered the job from reef and I was sitting there going, okay, if I take this job cynically, I was like, I see the rest of my life. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work here. I'm going to grow in the industry and it'll become some version of, 
of, you know, like everyone around you. Yeah. Everyone around me, like, you know, um, uh, Dylan Slater was my agent. He had just started working at rip curl and now he's the global sales director. And, you know, so I could kind of just see that being the trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I just thought to myself like, okay, I'm going to try something different. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay. Ended up moving to Maine. Spending a year in Maine studying furniture making. Wow. And then from there, I didn't know what I was going to do. I came back to California. In the time I was in Maine, I was like, okay, I want to study design or industrial design or furniture making or something like that as well. And so I applied to a few different art schools and got accepted to to them. But I went back to California that summer and was trying to figure out what I was going to do and ultimately ended up going to um, – going on and studying architecture. Wow. Okay. So it's just like, yeah. So it was just to go back on that. It was just like, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was just kind of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, like I said, at the end of the career, I started working with that last year, basically I started working with Ian Cairns Mm -hmm. and we sat down and he's like, listen, Mike, you've been on tour for this long. The judges aren't surprised by anything you do anymore. Like Mm. you can't wow them. Like, unless you reinvent your surfing, he's yeah. like, let's, let's really work on your surfing. Let's give this year 100%. You know, that might be it. <laughs> he had a really honest conversation with me and it kind of put it, you know, put it in perspective for me and clarified it. And it was interesting because that year, you know, I made the quarters in Durban. I had some really good results working with him and really noticed that my surfing improved. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, just it just was time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, uh, my contracts all came up kind of right around that time too. I was trying to figure out if I could like kind of transition more into a free surfer or a big wave surfer, or, and just nothing lined up. So yeah, I just was like, okay, let's let's try something different. Because I'm going to ask you this, uh, I may not be saying it right, but you thought you were going to be Kelly Slater when you were 12, 13, 14, right? I didn't, I wouldn't say Kelly Slater. Okay. All right. Tom <laughs> I thought Kern. I was, or not, okay, I thought not I was, Tom Kern. No, no, no. I Pick thought I was going to be, I thought I was going to be on par with like Joel and Mick and yeah. those guys. Okay. All right. Fair. Cause like, I don't know, in, in 2009, no, sorry, in 1999 or something, they did like the top 100 yeah. of juniors. And I think I was like six. Yeah. Like it was like Joel, Mick, um, Dean, yeah. Dino, yeah. like Fred, you know, it was like, and so I was in the mix. And so I kind of yes. just like, I had seen kind of my results coming from the amateur days. And so I kind of like had this idea that like, okay, that's, that's what I would consider successful. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I didn't, I wouldn't say it was like, I wasn't a failure. I, I made a living surfing yeah, and yeah. had fun. and got to see the world and, but never really felt like I lived up to the potential of, of uh, yeah. what it could have been or okay. what it, Sort of, yeah. All those guys you're traveling with sitting right next to you or, you know, having a beer with you after a heat or coming to your heat even, do you feel like they felt the same way as you did? Like, are all you, you group of guys all thinking you're going to be the top dog one day or one of the guys? You know, I think it varied. I okay. think there were some people that, that just kind of knew where they were. And oh, like, okay. we're taking advantage of the opportunity at like, okay, I'm in my early twenties and getting yeah. paid to surf and I get to travel and have fun. Cool. Yeah. And there were other people that were like, no, this is, I'm going to fucking go do this. Mm-hmm. And I'm here to kick ass and take names. And it wasn't <laughs> about, it wasn't about the money and it wasn't about the fun. Or, it was like, I'm going to go do this. Yeah. And like my last year, like I was saying, I kind of keep going back to it, but my last year as a, as an amateur competing, it was like, I don't know. I was in the zone for a year. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this then. Do you think the media boost you guys up? You know, the top hundred, the Groms, they're going to be something, you know, how they do that. Like you're talking about, you're in there. Yeah. Does that set up a young kid for, for possible failure or, or, or being bummed on themselves? I don't know what the, like, uh, yeah, these... not, I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I think it all depends. I think nowadays, Like one of the things that was great at our time Mm -hmm. and it grew, actually grew a bit was that there was, you know, quote unquote, a middle class. Okay. So there was like, you know, Kelly, Rob, ultimately Joel, Taj, Mick, that, 
grew, you know, crew, you know? Yeah. And then there was like that middle range, which is where I kind of was, um, uh, I'm trying to think like, you know, there's a whole crew in that, in that zone that could make a living. Yeah. We're surfing, did well, never really like kicked ass, but always, you know, we're doing it. Yeah. And then there was like the, 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 I don't know, like the, the, the one below that, which was, um, the guys that kind of were like, shit, I have this opportunity to do this for a few years. I'm going to go do it. Yep. Like I always thought it was really interesting. Heath Walker was telling me that at one point his parents were like, there's no way you're going to be a pro surfer. And he had been like a sh- training to be a chef mm-hmm. and he went to Europe mm-hmm. and won and won an event. Just to prove them wrong, probably. No, no, no. I mean, I think, yeah, I think ultimately on some subconscious level. Yeah, subconscious, that's what I mean, yeah. He showed up, won the event, and was like, fuck that, I'm going to do this. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, and it turned into that. So it was like, I think there were people that had, like, those experiences. Mm -hmm. And then there was also the people in the mid-range that, like, thought they were going to be something huge and nothing ever came of it. You know, so it was just like, I think everybody had – you know, I think it came down to so many different things. I mean, there yeah, were so 100%. many good surfers, the things that set them apart. And I think ultimately it comes down to confidence, psycho- psych- psychological stuff. It's all, I think it's all psychology. Okay. I mean, at a certain level of, of talent from there, I think it is. Yeah. What would you tell a kid now that, that surfs really well? Let's say he's in the top end of SSA or top of whatever, or pro, well, yeah, pro junior. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that's kind of why I brought up that middle class thing is yeah. I don't think that exists anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you're either, you know, uh, Griff or you're broke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like, that's kind of it. Right. I mean, it's okay. like, I, I don't I know. Mean, and, I, and I don't really, I, unfortunately, like I don't follow, surfing. I don't really follow. No, I totally follow surfing still. Like I watch the events and, okay. and all that sort of stuff. But I don't really follow the QS. I don't really, really follow NSSA. So I don't really know what's happening there. Yeah. But it seems to me like you're either, you know, making a million bucks or you're making 20 grand. Yeah. yeah. Like it's kind of like nowhere in between anymore. So how, how did you do with like photos incentives and stuff and ads? Did that like boost your, pro- your money up? And it's none of my um, business. You can tell me that yeah. as well. No, I mean, what was great for me as a, as a Grom is I had contest incentive and photo incentive. Really? Yeah. And so like when I won events, I was getting, I don't, I think at one point I was getting like 200 bucks an event or 250 so bucks for like a win. 18 year old or 17 year old? Well, no, this was like 16. Yeah. 15, yeah. 15. A little Grom. So like, I like, I got to, I saved up enough money to buy a little truck when I was 16. That's so awesome. Like a five, I bought a little pickup Toyota a Tacoma pickup truck for five grand. <laughs> that's so like, rad yeah so like i i was lucky that like those guys were i think they also knew my situation so they were like me out in every way they could and especially if it was um you know performance based and i was performing yeah. they were more than stoked to help me that's so right um and then once i turned pro it was all salary based and it was all up to me and there wasn't photo incentive and you know there were certain things like if you got a cover or yeah. if you if you were in surfer pole or Things like that, but um, right. for the most part, after that, it's just uh, uh, for what I had at least was just uh, just a base salary, and it was up to you to to kind of hit your goals. All right, how did you feel when you saw yourself in the magazine? I think when I was young, especially like my first few photos, I was super stoked. Mm-hmm. I think from a, a certain point on, it was kind of like, okay, that's my job; like it should be there. I think when I got stoked, it was because there was like a photo I really loved or something like that. Yeah. But then also like, I, th- I don't know if it's everybody or if just me, like, you know, there was always this part of me that was like, Oh, my arm should have been here or mm. like overanalyzing like, it. Yeah. It's overanalyzing going like, Oh, I, you know, work on your technique, man. Like get your arm around or turn your head or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Did you surf differently for the photo versus the contest heat? Did your mindset you know, change? I, you know, I think that was, it did. Um, I think at a certain point I, I think I started, I think that's ultimately kind of what happened was that like, 
I wasn't doing well in the event, so I'd get more conservative, and then that would make my surfing tighter, and then that would make me more conservative, and then that would make my tar- surfing tighter, and da 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 Okay. And I think the other part, too, was that um, at a certain point, I, you know, not in – in a way, I fell out of love with surfing. Okay. And so I wasn't surfing as often. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I wasn't getting loose, and I wasn't um, – kind of just intuitively improving. And that was kind of how I'd always surfed and gotten better as younger. And that's kind of what led me to work with Ian is because I was like, I need somebody that can see what's going on and, mm-hmm. and help me to make those adjustments. Cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just over analyzing. And then, you know, I definitely feel like, um, I think that was, you know, big part of it for me is I always over analyzing and my surfing got tighter and I was always after getting a good result and then that would make, if I didn't get it, that would kind of bum me out for the rest of the trip. And so it was just kind of this like, yeah, like kind of a, a hamster wheel thing that kind of happened. So what would you tell a, a up and coming oh. Grom? We forgot to answer that. I think you did. Yeah. Up and coming Grom. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't answer that. Yeah. They're going to be the top of the heap. Um, I think, I don't mean this by saying don't surf, but try to diversify your interests. Mm, okay. Like do other things as well. Okay. Whether it's reading or writing or snowboarding or whatever, mm-hmm. just so that you like keep life going. Keep it fresh. <laughs> so you, yeah, just keep life like just stay in life. Okay. Um stay in surfing for sure if that's your your passion, but just like remember that if you're I mean there's two aspects to it in a way. It's, um you know, love of surfing and then there's the business of surfing. Mm-hmm. And ultimately when you grow up, <laughs> and I, I don't mean that like as you get old, but quote unquote grow up, yeah, you, you got to make a living. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have those other interests at whatever level they are when you're younger and all of a sudden surfing's done, you're like, what the fuck do I do? Mm-hmm. And it happens in all sports, you know, like it can lead to depression. It can lead to all sorts of shitty things like that. People end up going and like having nothing else to do and they don't know what they want to do. So they go work in construction, you know, so it's like find other things you like. You know, if you're one of the 50 guys in the world that can make a living surfing, man, take advantage. Remember that like. Also, just remember there's a lot more to life to enjoy, to enjoy. Good words. What is your thoughts on uh, on social media and, and surfing versus like having mags? <sighs> I mean, I loved like I remember every time a magazine came out, yeah. it was like run down to the surf shop and just read every word. Right. With friends and get stoked on the on every photo. Um mm-hmm. I think there's some really great stuff about social media and the immediacy of it, Mm -hmm. like how fast you get to see what's happening, how many photos you get to see, the videos you get to see. Like, you know, I follow Italo and I get to see him surfing every day. (laughs) And working out. (laughs) And working out and (laughs) doing his thing. I don't know that I love those things as much as just, but seeing him rip and like, he's one of my top favorites for sure. That's cool. Um, I mean, I think because he's a goofy foot and all sorts of things. But yeah, like that sort of stuff is super cool. And it's also cool because people are able to parlay that into how they make their living. Like they don't have to, like it's kind of like a way to be a a free surfer again and make a living. But, you know, I think social media is tough. It does kind of what I was saying about like instead of people, and like enjoying the world they're sitting on their couch looking at their phone and stuck on it i mean one of the things that took me a while to really realize when i was traveling and it happened later in my career was like you're in france dude go to the winery Mm -hmm. (laughs) go drink some wine you're in portugal go check out some cool castle you know like yeah like i'm living in guadalajara and it's like there's cool museums and galleries and bars and restaurants and cafes and i mean it happens everywhere in the world and people are just sitting on their phone rather than like talking and looking around and seeing the world and yeah um so it's like a double-edged sword i guess it's kind of like how you use it right right 
WSL, what, what are your thoughts on WSL is it, from your time to today? Uh, There's some definite differences. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't been around too many events, but some of the things I would say are super positive are the, the way athletes are being taken care of. Yeah. Like they're actually like at the events, they're making the, they cater to the athletes. Like, you know, they have their, the bikes to warm up and they have the massage therapists and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And not that that's like, you know, that we, we need that, but just the fact that like they are recognizing that the athletes, you know, are important. Um, I think one of the things that happened in our era was like, there was kind of this confusion between like, who was more important, the event or the athlete? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> and it was like, okay, without the athlete, the event doesn't exist. So yeah, that one always kind of confused me. Um, but you guys were getting paid. Well, well, I don't know if this is what you mean, but the only the only time we got paid was prize money. Right. And the prize well, money was a lot. Oh, that's true. But the, the prize money was also a, a fraction of what it is now. Yeah. For example, if you won a three-star QS event, I think you got three grand to okay. win. Okay. And then second place got uh, 1500 Yeah. Third place got $750. Right. Fourth place got like 500 mm-hmm. So it's like you had to win the event to pay for your trip. <laughs> yeah. But all you guys had stickers all over your board. That's true. And, and nowadays there's guys like top dog guys, not the top guys, but, you know, guys yeah, that yeah, are 25 – that have not a sticker. They have no sponsors. <laughs> the one thing, the, but the, the you know the the kind of flip on that is that like they're getting ten grand to show up. Yes, that's true for last for last place. But there's eight contests, thing. so they make eighty thousand dollars a year, which is not that bad. <laughs> you know, it's really not. Okay, I, it's it's not it's, it's not, not good. It's not good as a pro athlete, like a top athlete in the world. No way. Yeah. If it sure beats um, working at a desk. <laughs> no, 100%. I mean, there's, yeah, there's good and bad. Okay. Did you consider yourself an athlete or a surfer? I think we were right on the cusp of that. Okay. You know, guys like Mick, I think the Australians, the Brazilian. No, I mean, I feel like pretty much everybody but the U.S. guys okay. had these like groups around them mm-hmm. that were like, no, you guys are athletes, not surfers. So like, you know, Mick and those guys were training, but okay. they're also surfing all day long. So it was like, you know, you had to have that balance. And and in California, that was just, we were right on the cusp. So there was guys who, if they had the right support system or group yeah. who were moving in that direction. Mm-hmm. And then there was the kind of guy, like, you know, the, the hangovers or the holdouts that were like, no, this, this isn't a sport. This is an art. This is... Uh, a culture a, a culture yeah so i think i gosh i don't know i mean i on like on like when i had to fill out what i did for a living i would say professional athlete oh yeah because you <laughs> so, were getting paid yeah but so, do you know what i mean like italo now or mick how you brought him up and these guys are like training like they're on a triathlon yeah um <laughs> jogging 10 yeah. miles or whatever, whatever yeah, they exactly. do exactly I don't know that I ever really had that frame of mind. Okay. I, I definitely made efforts. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of that guy, Marv Marinovich. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. Don't he's know. a, he's an old, uh, quarter, not quarterback, but he was like an old Raiders football player. Yeah. And he basically like is the guy who developed like cross training for, or training for all like NFL and trains all these athletes. Okay. I got put in touch with him and was training at his gym for a while. Wow. And that was rad because those were like guys I like looked at and were like, no, those dudes are athletes. So yeah. in a way, I, that's what I was working towards. But it just – it was kind of like it wasn't ever a system that really got implemented in my life. Okay. So it was kind of always this like ping pong of like, wait, I'm this. I'm going to go surf. I'm going to go work <laughs> out. And then it was like I went and worked out all day and I was too tired to go surf. So it was like that didn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, but uh, the generation before you, let's say 10 years before you, some of the guys were, you know, smoking a, pe- a cigarette before they went in their eat. Or oh, yeah. Out. I mean, it's funny. <laughs> I, I just went down to Pasquale's uh, last week for like three days, four yeah. days, and got some fun waves. But I don't know why it popped into my head. Oh, because I saw some dude that was kind of cracked out. And I was, I don't know why it cracked into my head, but 
you know that crazy turn that Tom Carroll did in the Pipe Masters yeah, back the in the one. day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The famous one. Yeah. So apparently he was on speed <laughs> <laughs> or on meth. <laughs> He'd like just smoke Dripping meth and went meth. out and surf this heat. Yeah. So it's like it was a different era. Yeah. For sure. A lot of people were still smoking pot when I was doing it. But then there were the guys that were like, didn't drink, didn't smoke, were in bed, you know, taking it really, really seriously. And then there was kind of a, the other half. All right, everybody. This is Mike and Mike Todd. And we are out of here. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you. Hey guys, Endless Summer Box Set. This thing is legit. It's authentic, numbered certificate in it. It has a five frame film strip from the original print. You will literally own a piece of history. It has a specially minted bronze medallion. Dude, that thing's sick. Okay, there's so much more here. Go to the show notes. There's a link on there. Go check this piece of history out. This thing's rad. Seriously. Smithsonian American History Museum has it. It took four years of research with 3.5 in production. All hand assembled. This thing's rad. So much to this awesome box set. Remastered DVD. Sharper images than the original film. But dude, this thing's so sick. Link in the show notes.